Good evening. I changed a little bit the, the topic of my talk, and I want to talk about the limitless nature of cancer immunotherapy and to ask, are we progressing at the fastest pace, pace that we can? And this, this topic is very close to my heart, both uh, as a physician immunotherapist and uh, as an immune checkpoint researcher. And first, the point I want to make is that it is very important to cure cancer, and that is because cancer is becoming the major illness of the Western world. And just to show you some interesting statistics that are actually very well known, um, in this slide, you can see a comparison between what's happening to uh, coronary heart disease, and you can see that the rate of this group of diseases as a cause of death is declining sharply. You can see that cancer as a cause of death is actually pretty stable, but cancer as a morbidity, as a disease, is actually going up and up and it is becoming actually the number one cause of human illness. When you see such a major issue in medicine, and you want, of course, to think of a successful strategy, then what you ask is, what has medicine been good at preventing or treatment, treating? What has medicine been actually doing well? And of course, the answer is eradicating infectious disease. I think there's no doubt to these days that both in prevention and in treatment, medicine has been quite good at eradicating disease. And let me just describe a little bit for you the mutual history of the human race and pathogens. And because of pathogens, this is the main incentive and the evolutionary force for the development of the immune system, which, by the way, when you look at the immune system of humans, and you look at the immune system of even very low species, from a molecular point of view, you see a lot of similarity, and you can clearly depict the evolution of very famous and well-known molecular modulators of the immune system, and you can see them in, in very low uh, species uh, and early forms of life. Actually, even plants. Even plants developed an immune system. The common denominator of all of these is to fight pathogens. <coughs> so how were pathogens threatening the well-being of humans that is changing across the development of the human society. In the beginning, when human beings were living in small clusters or small groups, they were constantly mobile, they were changing environment, and they were what we call uh, hunters, collectors. Actually, they did not suffer very much from infectious disease. They had accidents, they were threatened threatened by nature, by prey, but they were not so much subjected to pathogens. The problem started with the development of agriculture. Agriculture brought two changes in the style, in the lifestyle of humans. One was that um, people stay in the, stayed in the same place, and the other is that they had to use um, Bakar, um, cattle to, uh, to plow, to, um, to process, uh, and to do the hard chore um, related to agriculture, and then they were exposed to vectors carried by cattle, by house uh, uh, animals, and then uh, measles, and and um, mumps, and infections, and the bacteria of the intestine started being a major problem, including, of course, smallpox, uh, parotitis, and other infectious disease. But the major problem of ch or challenge for the immune system started with the uh, surge of um, urbanization, where density, 
low hygiene, sewage problems became a major prototype of how humans lived. And of course we know that then uh, parasites, um, um, fleas, beets, um, um, secretions, all of them uh, started to take a major role in the spread of infectious disease followed by immigration. And actually, human race was exterminated in large proportion during epidemics of infectious disease, and this became the number one killer of humans. And maybe the turning point and the early success of medicine, when medicine was so undeveloped and uh, even did not completely understood what actually is, is going on is the story of Edward Jenner. He was um, a community physician working among, the, among peasants, and he had a very um, peculiar observation, and that was that during epidemics of smallpox, always it was the milk girls uh, milking cows that were either getting the disease in a very uh, attenuated um, course or maybe even not, um, not getting the disease at all, even when all other inhabitants of the farm were getting ill. And he had this observation that on the hands of the milking girls, the, there was a modified form of smallpox that was called cowpox and the, it was a typical lesion of smallpox, but only a single one. No widespread disease, of course, involving not just the skin, but also internal organs. So he had this idea that there is something protective about those vesicles or pustules that develop on the hands of, uh, of the milking girls. And what he actually did was to take a peasant boy from one of the farms, and actually infect the child with smallpox. But then, a few days later, inoculate the child with the contents of a pustule that he took from a milking girl. And the child had a very attenuated course of the disease. He did not actually um, display all the severe symptoms of smallpox. And that was a huge discovery even by that time, there was uh, already medical uh, literature, and it was published. And actually, this was um, the first successful vaccination for an infectious disease. And I think the analogy between the success of preventing uh, infection with a pathogen by doing vaccination was so strong that when people were thinking how to prevent cancer, this analogy was still controlling the thinking and the perception that even years later, cancer was still likened to an infectious disease in the thought of how to try to prevent cancer or at least to attenuate the course of disease. And when you look at the history of um, immunotherapy for cancer, you can see that actually this history was completely controlled by the persistent attempt to vaccinate or immunize against cancer and to try to somehow repeat the same success that was produced for infectious disease. Of course, the techniques were more sophisticated, the knowledge was more complex, the whole um, methodology of vaccinating became much more complex with adjuvants and the way of administration and modifying antigens and everything that the vaccination community learned to do, but still no success, not in preventing cancer and of course not in influencing the course of the disease. But things changed and in order to explain how the change actually happened, it is important just to introduce to you the effector, the major effector cells of the immune system, and these are the lymphocytes, and they split into B cells and T cells. B cells are 
roughly the producers of the antibodies, proteins that they secrete, and those proteins can cluster and either capture or interrupt uh, with vital functions of uh, pathogens or cells, and the T cells, our, let's say, like, let's call them the, the warriors against cancer, are the ones that attack complete cells, especially when these cells carry pathogens in them, or when these cells, for some reason, change their normal constituents and in a way are um, analogous to infected cells, and they can kill. They are actually the killers. And this is a, 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 a second time that infectious disease meet cancer. In the beginning, this encounter was detrimental because it yielded an analogy that actually had no, um, no real um, validation. But now, here is a new encounter and a very successful and fruit fruitful one, and that is the encounter between the community of the researchers of chronic infectious disease. And now um, the leading investigators, the heroes, that by the way were considered when this year the Nobel Prize went to uh, James Ellison and Tasuko Honjo that I will uh, introduce to you in, in a minute. These people were also considered for the Nobel Prize for the discovery of immune checkpoints. And these people are not at all cancer uh, researchers. This is Rafi Ahmed from Georgia and uh, John Wery from Philadelphia, and what they were actually studying is how chronic infection manage to skip recognition by immune cells. And what, what they uh, actually found is a phenomenon that we call exhaustion. So they followed the course of infection from the acute phase. They simply use pathogens that can split to um, those causing acute illness and recovery, and those of the same type that cause a very prolonged course of infection. And they found that when they isolate immune cells from acute infection and they compare them to cells isolated from chronic infection, there's one major difference. <coughs> and that major difference were molecular constituents um, that they named checkpoints, not only they, but the whole community named checkpoints, and um, they were the ones to say stop for immune activation. It's like our immune system gives us five to seven good days to combat invaders. Five days have elapsed, a week passed, enough because if the immune response will go on and on and on, um, all the unwanted side effects will become more dominant rather than the eradication of the pathogen. And to name the exact name of that molecule that they found, they found a surface protein on immune cells that they named PD-1 or programmed death receptor. And actually back in 2006, it's it is 12 years from now. Those years, there was no successful treatment, no successful immunotherapy for cancer, but already the cancer community realized that something is on the verge of being discovered. And the famous Cancer Research Institute, Cancer Research Institute actually named those researchers of infectious disease as those who are going to make an impact in cancer therapy, cancer medicine, and they received the 2006 prize. A person that was very much tuned to what's going on in this field is James Ellison. James Ellison was an immunologist studying a strain of mice that died at the age of 21 days because of excessive immune response. And he was asking himself, why is this excessive exaggerated immune response, he found the reason, and he came to recognize that there are modulators to the strength of the immune response from a different angle or from a different uh, path. 
and the modulator that he managed to discover was another surface receptor on lymphocytes that was named CTLA4. So CTLA4 belongs to Jim Allison. PD-1, not belong, but was claimed by the infectious disease. And all those years, there was another hero of the story. And this is Tasuko Honjo, one of the Nobel Prize um, winners of this year. Um, a physician and the head of the medical chemistry department in the University of Kyoto. And actually he's one of the leading immunologists. And the surprise is that if you will ask the immunology um, community, you will see that he largely is quite unknown. And I think this is the problem when your English is probably as broken as those used to speak Japanese because actually his discovery was done even earlier than the, than the infectious disease, disease and it took, to my feeling, too long time for the community to realize that he actually is showing something very important. So Honjo, um, completely unrelated to cancer, was occupied with the question, what would happen if you will activate the immune system excessively? And actually, he was the first to realize that there is this modulator called program death one, a mechanism that is dictated, inherently dictated in immune cells to stop them from being activated. And actually what he did was to strongly activate immune cells and then to see what is leading them to program death and he cloned the gene that is uh, responsible for this program death and it took several further years for him to make the connection to cancer and actually the one who did the connection to cancer was one of his students that then, or collaborators that then moved to a big um, cancer center in Boston, Dana Farber, and this is uh, Gordon Freeman. Again, another name that was mentioned in relation to people um, associated with the discoveries that led to the current Nobel Prize. And what Gordon Freeman actually found, I think, was um, very significant. He found that this surface protein on immune cells needs to be activated or operated. Operated in order to cause the exhaustion of the lymphocytes. So what is giving the signal for the exhaustion phenomenon, and they actually found that there is a ligand, we call it, this, this is the partners. One is a receptor, one is the ligand, but what is very important that he actually found is that this ligand is overexpressed on many cancers. So this is just a cartoon to show you what, what happens in normal tissue and what can happen in cancer. So normal tissue, let's, let's imagine an immune cell coming to attack a normal tissue. There is a recognition, but the normal tissue says, hey, don't touch me. How is the normal peripheral tissues protecting themselves? They express this ligand that will send the immune cell to exhaustion. Okay, so the immune cell is sent to exhaustion and not harmful any, anymore. The problem is that the cancer exploits the exact same mechanism. So this is a non-small cell lung cancer, and the brown you can see on the cells is actually that same ligand, PDL1. And what is the cancer doing? So let's imagine, again, a T cell coming to kill the cancer because it has the capacity to recognize that this is a foreign entity. What is the cancer doing? The cancer is expressing. The PDL1, the PDL1 is activating that program death mechanism in the T cell, and the T cell disappear. And this is a major way by which cancer actually escape immune response. This is so major, this, this capacity of the tumor to escape immune recognition and immune destruction, that when an antibody, a drug, was developed, to block the connection between PD-1 and PDL-1, it was so influential 
in preventing death of patients with a metastatic disease that you can see the gap in this graph. We call this graph Kaplan-Meier survival curve. It's not easy to, to seek those Kaplan-Meier curves because what they tell is, is a very um, threatening story of how a disease cause that 100% of the people receiving the treatment a long time will become few and few with the treatments that we had. And this is not too many years ago. This is less than 10 years ago, years from now. But when people with the same situation of cancer, widespread cancer, were receiving just these biologics that is preventing the exhaustive interactions from immune cells, look what happened to their likelihood to stay alive. It is actually doubled. And it is not just likelihood to stay alive, but it also means that the disease will not develop. What you can see in this um, curve of patients, patients depicted in uh, pink are the ones receiving conventional treatment. And on the y-axis, you can see re recurrence or the disease coming back. To what percent of the patients did the disease uh, come back. And you can see that actually those receiving traditional treatment in the majority, the disease came back. But those receiving the separation between the trigger for exhaustion, you can see that after a very short peri period of time where all the failures, or most of the fail failures were occurring in an early phase, everybody that actually moved on in follow-up from that early phase, the disease in the majority of those patients actually did not progress. There was no disease prog progression, which is just amazing to think of when you think of a drug that does nothing directly against cancer. This is not chemotherapy. This is not poison. There is no toxicity. No capacity of the drug to directly target the cancer. The only mechanism that this drug is interfering with is in the induction of exhaustion on immune cells. What does it mean? What this actually implies is that even in advanced stages of, of, stages of certain cancers, the body has the capacity to recognize cancer, no need for the vaccination perhaps. The whole vaccination approach was probably unnecessary because those killer cells are there, but they are in a state of exhaustion. And we actually need to revive them. And if we will do that, what you can see here now is a much more recent data from what's happening to patients that already stopped taking the treatment. They are not under treatment anymore. And you can see that once the immune system was activated and the process was ignited, actually there is no need to give of course, this is after two and sometimes three years of treatment. But then when treatment was stopped in the majority of the patients, the disease did not progress. So there was an internal contro control that was built in the patients. And I think this is something that an, as an oncologist, you really want, want to witness. This is a real success. Now comes the story of pharma companies. As you can guess, once a pharma company is involved in the development of a drug that can, can be so effective against cancer, of course there will be, this is a blockbuster, and the, the thought will be, how can we maximize the effect of the treatment? A company by the name of BMS, Bristol Myers Squibb, actually was having intellectual property on the two checkpoints that I described, the one by Jim Ellison with the, the person with the mice displaying excessive immune capacity. The other was from Honjo. Actually, Honjo in the end sold his uh, IP to Bristol Myers Squibb. And they said, oh, we have good drugs, but let's not compete with ourselves. So let's try and give both of them together. And that's what they did. They compared giving the Ellison drug, the Honjo drug, and the two drugs together. And you can see that giving the two drugs together is even better. 
So this is really a good solution when you don't want to compete with your own products. In fact, what Bristol knows and what Merck knows and what many other pharma company knows is it's not just the story of the PD-1 and the CTLA-4. There are tens, there are hundreds of potential checkpoints for the immune system. They can be discovered. It's not very complicated. They are actually in the process of being discovered. And another thing, there are not just those lymphocytes around the tumor. That are, there are so many other players. There are other immune cells. There are other blood cells, connective tissue cells. And each one of them has some influence on what's going on in the tumor microenvironment. And you can see this micrograph. Each color you see in the micrograph depicts one set or subset of cells. And you can see how many of them are around cancer cells. And the market now is in surge. Actually, there's no good pharma company who does not own a very active department of uh, immuno-oncology. And some of these drugs are going to be very good drugs. They are going to be very good drugs. Not only for melanoma, the disease that was the first disease for the discovery, then came lung cancer, then came cancers of the head and neck, then came cancers of the um, digestive system on the condition that they had defects in DNA repair, lymphomas, urotelial cancers, renal cancer. Actually, if you ask yourself, where are we lagging behind? It is sadly breast cancer, um, pancreatic ovarian. This is where we are not still doing very well in activating the immune system. I want to just briefly tell you a story of one of my patients to demonstrate how powerful is the effect of um, these drugs. So this is an 88-year-old lovely gentleman that three years ago um, came with a very painful mass in his face. He had a biopsy done. The biopsy showed that this is a metastatic melanoma. He had severe pain. In a few days from functional active person, he became um, a sick person who needs morphine to control the pain. And when this, this is a scan that we do for the face, and if you want to know where the cancer is, you can see that this hot spot, this red spot, shows you, demonstrates where the cancer is because this spot is where sugar is being absorbed. This is what the, this test is about. And, that, and, and the gentleman received a single dose of that PD-1 blocking antibody. And following three doses of the PD-1 blocking antibody, this was his scan. The previous scan was for March. Three months later, June, you see nothing. It's just nothing. And you know, always when oncologists insist on treating patients at any age, and elderly patients, there's this, um, oh, let go, why are you insisting, why do that? So do you know that the um, population of the third age are the best responding to immunotherapy? So it's a miracle. In a sense, it's a miracle. I think even immunologists, when they see this, they still pinch themselves to believe that actually I witnessed this. I, I did nothing. No radiation, no chemotherapy, tumor gone. But there's a cost. So how much the miracle cost? You can see it's very hard to know really um, the Kupot Cholim, the HMOs, how much really do they pay for the companies. But let's say that the official prices that are mentioned for the PD-1 drug is um, around $12,000. 12, $12, per months of treatment, and we are talking about two years. Uh, the combination is actually $47,000 per month of treatment. And the combination is shorter, but, but this gives you some idea of the magnitude of the cost. Now let's take a look at the Israeli basket, the increase for the Isra Israeli basket. The story I'm telling you is getting into effect 2014. 
the basket has not enlarged so no, has not increased so much in cost. And actually, what you see is increasing is the participation of the private and personal insurances in sponsoring uh, med medical treatment. What you can see here is what is the expense for healthcare in the average OECD country, and you can see what is the expense in Israel. It's less. On that token, you can see what's happening to the self-financing of households in Israel or participation in medical care. And you can see that it is constantly increasing. Now imagine a situation. Right now we have two very good drugs. Next year we'll have very good four drugs. And maybe in five years we'll have very good ten drugs. And you can keep getting them because each one of them is tackling the immune system from a different angle. What will we do? How will we carry the cost? So this is number, this is one problem face, that we are facing and this, this is good treatments. What are the other limits for rapid drug development in this direction? The FDA, the FDA approval rate. This is one gatekeeper. Another problem, what is the incentive of the pharma companies to keep developing? BMS found the solution. They had two competing drugs. They don't want to compete, so they gave them together. But why should you develop competing drugs? You, you have one blockbuster. Why compete with yourself? So you not only control this market, but if you found, find, let's say, some peripheral lab with a good discovery, what would you do? You would simply purchase the discovery, and you quietly kill this in your archives. And this is done. And lastly is, of course, the burden on the national budget. You can see the small number of FDA drug approvals per year. You would think that the FDA is bombed with lots of drugs. You see the FDA is not bombed <laughs> with lots of drugs. They are aware for the need to accelerate drug approvals. A country like ourselves would not approve independently a drug that was not approved by the FDA. And you can see why the incentive of pharma companies would not be um, vast in developing a large repertoire of drugs because as early as four years after a patent has been given on a drug, the competitors can already start developing a generics. And this early as four years before a patent expires, the competitors can start doing clinical trials. So that at the, on the day of expiry of a patent, the competitors will come with a generic and of course cut the market prices. And so, okay, so what are the public priorities? And this is a question. Should we invest in disease prevention still? Last year, a lot of the um, increase in salabriut was given to combat hepatitis. This is very important. It's a major public health issue. Infectious disease, should we give a lot to the few? Should we make a once personal health allowance per sick person. So all of these are open questions that I'm sharing with you. Um, being very well aware of the big change that is, that is happening in cancer medicine. So thank you for listening. <laughs>